Hi, I'm Brian Litvak. I'm the CEO and co-founder of League Apps. I'm excited to be leading the final day of Next Up University. This is League Apps' opportunity to share best practices and skill development with you, the most inspiring and innovative sports leaders within our communities. Today, we'll share our perspective on how technology and software have and is disrupting and evolving new sports. But before that, we have a bit of a history lesson. In the past, youth sports has been influenced by four main factors, religious beliefs, educational reform, societal and parenting trends, government policy and legislation. Not until quite recently has technology had an impact on youth sports, but we believe it will have the most influence over future generations. First, let's take a journey through time and show how all of these influences have led youth sports to where it is today. A special shout out to Tom Ferry, creator of Project Play and author of Game On for publishing some great information on the history of youth sports, much of which has inspired some of the ideas I'll share today. In the beginning, there was no such thing as team sports. There were dinosaurs. There were glaciers, there were cavemen, but there was no sports. Sure, athletic feats had some bright spots in the dark ages, like the ancient Olympics in Greece, but most of these ancient competitions were individual athletic feats of strength. No bat, no ball, no teams. Think about this. Humans have been on earth for 200,000 years and only in the last 150 of them has the concept of team sports existed. That's less than 1% of all time. We're lucky to be alive right now during the era of team sports. Bo Schembechler, the great Michigan football coach, once proclaimed, think what a great thing it is to be part of something that is the team. Here in North America, indigenous tribes have been playing a spiritual ball and stick game long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. This game would later be coined lacrosse by French settlers in America. However, for much of the early part of American history, there was no concept of sports or games. Religion was the main influence in society and any form of play was viewed as an unnecessary distraction. In fact, religious groups had tried to ban sports on Sundays. But in the late 1880s, a new movement called Muscular Christianity started to support a more active sports life. According to Wikipedia, Muscular Christianity combined discipline, self-sacrifice, masculinity, and the moral and physical beauty of athleticism. Muscular Christianity also preached the spiritual value of sports, especially team sports. Modern team sports, as we know it, really owes a debt of gratitude to the Industrial Revolution. Huh? Well, let me explain how things went down. In the late 1800s, the advance of manufacturing led to factories, which brought large groups of people together in cities. It changed the operating manu manual for society and communities. Kids started to attend school regularly. Education became a requirement. A child's day became more organized. The idea of parks started to incorporate playgrounds. These were safe public spaces that provide recreational opportunities for kids to play. Give kids some turf and magic happens. Kids started playing with rules. Voila, we have sports. Sports become scholastic and is incorporated into education. In 1903, New York City established the public schools athletic league. Schools began competing against each other. Soon after, dozens of cities from similar, formed similar organizations. This is the first time sports are organized within schools. With this, adults manage sports for kids with structured planning and curriculum. These school-based programs had a mission to educate students in physical fitness, character development, and social skills through sports pro programs that would encourage teamwork, discipline, and sportsmanship. In the early part of the 20th century, our national love obsession with sports blossomed. President Teddy Roosevelt, a former boxer, is considered the first jock. He declares that team sports are positive and important and a great way to teach boys how to work together productively. 
He says things like, only aggressive sports can create the brawn, the spirit, the self-confidence and quickness of men essential for the existence of a strong nation. Sports grew in popularity throughout the country. Unfortunately, the Great Depression gets in the way. Publicly financed youth sports are shut down. Poorer children lose the opportunity to play. Enter the baby boomers. After the Great Depression, social organizations like the YMCA and Boys and Girls Clubs begin to offer sports programs. National sports associations are created and pay to play leagues grow in popularity and engulf the country. Pop Warner football is created in 1929. In 1939, Carl Statz starts a little league with three teams in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. By the 1950s, there were over 5,000 Little League organizations and an International Little League World Series held each summer. At the very same time, new education policies influence youth sports. Educators worry that sports in elementary school would create too much competition. By the 1960s, the self-esteem movement prolongs organized sports until later ages. This is the reason why most organized school sports do not begin until middle school. Combined, these factors lead to a youth sports path that starts with local community programs and that feeds into middle school and high school sports teams. It works for a while. Just ask your favorite baby boomer about how great sports was for them growing up. Two important government policies would also have an impact on how sports is organized. First, let's talk about Title IX. Up until the early 1970s, sports was mostly organized exclusively for boys. Title IX is passed as a federal civil rights law as part of the Education Amendments of 1972. This law protects people from discrimination based on gender in education programs that receive federal financial assistance. Even though the original statute made no explicit mention of sports, the implementation of Title IX helps create gender equality in school athletics. If you build it, she will come and females flock to sports. By 2006, there was an increase of nine times in the number of women participating in sports in high school and by 450% in college athletics. Girls' participation in sports rose from one in every 27 females to almost 40% of all high school girls. In the same decade, Congress passed the Amateur Sports Act of 1978. It empowered the U.S. Olympic Committee as the sanctioning of sports-specific national governing bodies also called NGBs. The USOC also became the coordinating body for grassroots sports and youth sports. But the law didn't provide any form of funding to the USOC so that it could fulfill its mandate for grassroots sports. The, USC, the USOC decides to focus on elite athletes. Its mandate is about gold medals, not mass participation. This is reinforced in 1988 with the Steinbrenner Commission. Yup, that George Steinbrenner which announces that it's all about the gold. USOC allocates less than 1% of their budget on creating pathways for youth sports and coaches training. A void is created. Schools don't provide, provide sports until middle school. This is a societal trend that dates back to the 60s. The organization's task with organizing race sports isn't focused on the local communities. This is influenced by federal legislation. This creates conditions for independent organizations across the country to cobble together solutions for their communities. In the 1990s, youth sports turns into a chase for college scholarships. Education once again influences youth sports, albeit in an interesting way. A societal and educational trend is that colleges become more competitive. Parents figure out that sports is a way to get ahead. Sports can help kids get into college. Sports can have the economic incentive through scholarships. Sports becomes an investment for parents, not just an investment of time and passion, an investment of dollars. Youth sports becomes a game for which parents are obsessed. Increased competition leads to sports specialization. Tom Ferry, the journalist and project play creator, writes in his book that, child, that prepared childhood was emerging replacing the idea of a protected childhood that had been promoted a decades after World War II. The goal of creating normal children to fit into society is replaced by the desire to create special kids, ones best prepared to rise above the masses. This leads to the professionalization of youth sports. By the early 2000s, for-profit, private, 
Travel clubs become the norm in most middle class and affluent communities. Sports becomes privatized through a pay for pay play model focused on fulfilling the insatiable demand of parents. Parents feel the need to make sure that their kids' lives are organized. Why is this happening? Well, we can think of 50 billion reasons. That's our estimated size of the youth sports economy. Each week, millions of children play some form of organized athletics in every community in the US and around the world. This engaged audience is the largest fan base in all of sports, even bigger than the NFL and all the pro sports leagues. So what comes next? And when do we start talking about technology? Because of these different influences, religion, society, government, education, youth sports has evolved in interesting ways. Now we face a challenge in youth sports. How do we attract and retain kids so they can have positive sports experiences? How do we align the interests of kids with their parents, their coaches, and their clubs? Right, right now, youth sports is not operating efficiently. Kids are playing organized sports earlier than before. Youth sports is structured as a pyramid designed to get the most talented kids to the next competition level through travel clubs and the college and pro leagues. Kids are quitting for good at a very young age. According to Michigan State researchers, the organizational structure of sports in the United States and not a lack of interest on the part of potential enrollees is primarily responsible for the reduction in participation at age 14 and beyond. So here, my friends, is where software and technology can be a catalyst for innovation. According to David Drummond, a former Google executive, speaking to Project Play in 2014, the conditions are ripe for innovation and disruption. There is a huge unmet need in youth sports for all the kids that don't have a sports program that fits their needs. It can be a financial issue, it can be a product issue, it can be a social issue, but something's getting in the way. The opportunity is here for someone who is entrepreneurial and thinks differently to come up with something better, something cheaper, something easier, something more engaging for kids. The opportunity is to create a simple, open source format to encourage innovation. Google did this when they built Android, a common platform that all stakeholders can build on. The great ideas will come from the front lines, from the operators. They just need a common framework or platform based on a joint set of principles. Elevate the great thinkers and leaders, experiment, measure, and iterate. Finally, Drummond says that Google Way is to be audacious. Even if it might not work, it will push us ahead. We see technology, software, and data as the influence that can elevate youth sports. League Apps counts over 250 software companies that are creating solutions in the youth sports space. These companies and individuals are working on problems in over 30 different categories, from background checks to coaching tools, body metrics to field space management. It's fo we're focused on every role in youth sports and how youth sports is experienced for organizers, coaches, parents, and most importantly, kids. Just name a challenge in youth sports and there is a talented engineer out there working on a way to solve us. This gives us hope. Innovation is a new way of solving existing problems. There is no better way to innovate than leveraging software and technology. At League Apps, we wanna be part of that. So let's play together and let's play forever.